lights on. Hello, welcome to Recovery Alive. Let's all stand up together. Guys, thanks so much for joining us today. When darkness tries to roll over my bone, when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own, when brokenness and pain is all I know, I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. All right, here we go. Cause my fear who doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. has a place to hide. I am not a captive to the light. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. Oh, I won't be shaken. Oh, I won't be shaken. Cause my fear it doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Oh, oh, oh. let's say there's power. There's power that can break off every chain. That's right. There's power that can empty out a grave. power that can save. There's power in your name. There's power in your name. Oh, there's power that can break off every chain. Oh, there's power that can empty out a grave. Oh, there's a resurrection power that can save. There's power Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Jesus, we're seeing love. Oh, my fear, it doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. We're standing on the love of the Lord. Standing on your love. God, we are so, so grateful to be here today with you to stand in your presence, Lord, to lift up the name of Jesus, the only name that can save. Lord, but we believe there is power in that. There is power when we sing your praises, God. God, we're calling on that power today, Lord, to make dead things alive, to make the lost found again. God, we believe. All my words fall short I got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs As I often do But every song Stand, and you never do. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause 
God, we just want to say we're thankful, Lord. We're thankful for the breath in our lungs. We're thankful that you woke us up this morning and you brought us here because you have a mighty work in store for us today. Lord, we believe it. We believe that every day is a gift. Lord, every day is a miracle. Because every day you are walking with us and you have mercy for us. So we're just grateful, God. We're grateful. We stand here in excited anticipation of what you have to say to us today, Lord. And all of this we say in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen, y'all. All right. Let's be social. Let's be friends. Find someone, give them a big hug, tell them you're glad they're at recovery today.
How's everybody? Yeah. You're like, yeah. Uh, my name is John. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus. I struggle with codependency and anger. Welcome to Recovery Live. It's our Wednesday lunch edition. And uh, we've had a busy weekend. Huh? How many of y'all went to the wonderful uh, mental health coaching weekend? And Friday was amazing with... Uh, Bishop Daryl Clark, wasn't he awesome? We got to get him back here. Sunday was awesome. Dr. Tim Clinton and Zach Clinton just really, really brought it. And um, this morning went to a uh, Johnstonian news breakfast for the best of. And I just want to congratulate all the people who make Recovery Alive work. Uh, got voted the best community resource, Recovery Alive. How about that? That's pretty cool. And thank Pastor Rodney for supporting Temple's, uh, Temple's Support of Recovery Alive. And uh, just proud of everybody who makes this uh, ministry run, from the folks who set up chairs to the folks who make our lunch and dinner, order pizzas, just make sure everything goes without a hitch. Uh, Jeremy, how many of y'all appreciate Jeremy and his worship and all that gets done here that is behind the scene victor and, and faith and the media team there's just so many people who make this thing go and we're just very very grateful folks on the cameras um yeah folks doing outreach just uh it's a beautiful beautiful thing and um uh, i'm just grateful that i get to be a part of of something that's truly changing folks lives friday is going to be really special we're going to be graduating a whole lot of process group folks who are who are moving bravely and courageously through that 12-step process, they got to the fourth step, and they didn't go screaming and running away. They stayed in it to the fifth and the sixth step. Uh, it's hard, right? I mean, it's work, but it works if you work it, and we're seeing that happen. We'll have a couple of people share what God's doing through that process, um, and uh, as we kind of start Mental Health Month, in, and this is the month of May, it's a really appropriate thing to talk about uh, reconciling our relationships with other people through the steps. Uh, steps four through through nine are really the steps of reconciling our relationship with others. Steps one through three are steps for reconciling with God, right? I can't, he can't, I think I'll let him. It's that letting go. It's that allowing the grace of Jesus Christ to do the work in our lives that we can't do in ourselves. Y'all know that we're saved by grace, yeah? Not by works that anyone should boast. And then we get into our relationships with other people, and there's some work to do. How many of you know people are a lot of work? Yeah. Woo! Woo! How many of you know relationships are a lot of work? Don't look at anybody. Yeah. They are, it's hard work, right? And sometimes it's super rewarding, and sometimes it's, want to tear your hair out and go like why isn't this working um you do the right thing and people still act like rear ends yeah they, yeah it, it, right and and so it's it's difficult your relationship with god he never leaves us he never forsakes us he never fails us he's always shown up for me he's always faithful people are not the same way are they and that's frustrating right especially in the context of church and we sort of have expectations. I don't know about you. I kind of have high expectations of people who go to church. Anybody been disappointed by church people? Have you ever, as a church person, disappointed somebody else? We're, we're quick to go, like, I'm not perfect. If we screw up, right? But if somebody else screws up, you're like, you're supposed to be perfect. You're supposed to be better than this, right? And so, um, man, relationships are very difficult. So we're going to cover step nine in May, and again, I think it's just appropriate in mental health. A lot of um, symptomology that we have with mental health has to do with relationships with others. Either um, we kind of show our mental health issues when we're dealing with people, or people bring it out in us, right? <laughs> Sometimes they can bring out anxiety and depression and frustration and anger. Um, and so this step for mental health month I think is just it's just strong it's right on the money and it's the power of grace anybody out there need grace yeah anybody struggle to give it at times to other folks yeah so step nine is, is ex about extending grace we extended forgiveness to those who had harmed us except what to do so would injure them 
or others. All right? Let's go ahead and read together 2 Corinthians 5.18. All of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. It's a task. Do you, do you kind of like how the Bible reinforces the proof that this is hard work? I've been married, I'll be married 25 years, June 27th. Don't clap yet, because June 27th, it hasn't come here yet. Okay, so we, <laughs> you never know if she's like, all right, that's enough. Um, but I think when I do marriage counseling, the thing I notice the most is how shocked people are that marriage takes hard work. You kind of get into marriage and, and you think like, it should just come naturally. You just figure, you'll just figure it out, it'll be fine. And then you're just shocked at how much work this stuff is. And that's sometimes what I've seen that marriages fail, relationships fail just for the, the lack of the understanding that this is a task, that this takes effort, this takes work. And so um, we're kind of gonna be pushing into this idea of grace as something that's very intentional to do. There's a doing of grace, extending this um, in, and not just acts of forgiveness, but just in something that we call a, a lifestyle of grace, a lifestyle of grace. Grace is not just this one-time thing that we received upon salvation. Grace is a lifestyle. It's a way that we see the world. It's a way that we live in this world. And I want you to just try to wrap your head around the fact that grace is a lifestyle. Can you just say that with me? Grace is a lifestyle. You can choose to live it or choose not to live it, but I believe that that is the way of freedom. And so um, our core question today, what emotional cargo are you carrying that you need to offload? What emotional cargo are you carrying that you need to offload? And that comes out of the Recovery Live Handbook. It's the second question in chapter nine and step nine. And um, what I'm gonna just talk about kind of briefly today is uh, a lesson that I'm gonna entitle Flying Lessons, all right? Flying Lessons. How many of you all have flown before in your life? Have you ever flown in an airplane before, yeah? All of you or some of you or most of you, okay. Um, when you fly, there's kind of two types of people. Those who are willing to risk checking baggage and those who are like for the life of me I don't have I don't care if I have to carry something that looks like a coffin and try to make them stuff that into the overhead compartment I'm going to bring my luggage with me I'm going to handcuff myself to the luggage because I am not going to allow them to handle it because it will get lost there's those kinds of people they don't care they're carrying a gigantic huge piece of luggage that they know that somebody's going to come along with a little tag and put it on their bag and say, you cannot bring this on the airplane, but they bring it with them because they just don't want to check it because it can get lost. And then there's the people who are just like, sure, I'll check all my baggage. And they walk around kind of free and clear around the terminal. Um, any people, I don't know how much you guys fly. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The fo Yeah, so I, like for me, I, I'm kind of both. I was pretty trusting until I went to Minnesota and they lost my luggage and I was a smelly dirty mess for about three days and uh, I really couldn't get out because there was um, there was about 60 inches of snow on the ground and so I didn't have anything to wear for like two or three days until it kind of cleared up and so now I'm, I'm a little bit more like I'm gonna take my stuff with me but when I do check my baggage how many of you guys know how much your baggage needs to weigh? Anybody know? 50 pounds. And when you're traveling as, uh, as, a, as a husband and father, uh, I have four daughters, they're not good at judging how much 50 pounds is in a suitcase. <laughs> and so um, you see them in their rooms, like sitting on... They're just sitting on the uh, right on the suitcase, trying to get everything. They got curler, curling irons, and 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 blow dryers in there, and stuffed animals, and books, and computers, and televisions, and dressers, and they're just stuffing everything they could possibly put in this. I'm saying, well, when will you use this? We're going to be gone for three days. They got 14 pairs of shoes. 
You know what they say? I like to have choices. You women are like, yeah, right? And I'm like, come on, man. So they're just packing all stuff. So we're wheeling this down, you know, to the, and they're like, now this is, I'm telling you, like, this is heading up to the counter. And they're like, hey, dad, how much room do you have in your suitcase? Do you know why they're asking that? Because they know they're over and that they're going to be stuffing it. I don't know if you've been around like the American Airline or United Airline, like the, the counters, and you see people with their suitcases open, and they're like putting one. It's usually from, this is sexist, but it's usually from a female's bag to a male's bag is what's usually happening. There is <laughs> like, there's so much stuff in one suitcase and they're putting it in another one. And so, but I've gotten pretty good at kind of like judging. I'll pick up the suitcase and I kind of feel like, this feels like it could be a little bit over or whatever. And so it's always a little bit scary when you get that suitcase up to the scale and there's the, the scale, the little digital scale, and you put it on there and it's going 49.7. Yes! 52.8. No! And here's the thing. It can be 50.1. And guess what? You ain't going to fly sometimes. It ain't just about paying. You're not flying. Get rid of something. Uh, what do you mean get rid of something? No, you, you can't, you're not putting that on here. Nope. And here's the thing is I think a lot of us want to have healthy relationships. We want our life to look different. We want to be happy. We want to recover. We're working our program. We are attempting to go out and use the stuff that we are learning. We want to love the people who are closest to us. We want to serve and not feel insecure. We want to go to work and not feel like we are offended when somebody slights us. But something just stirs in us, and the next thing you know, you say something you didn't mean to say, and you go, man, how did I, how did I do that again? Or you... Somebody goes, man, you got an attitude today. And you're like, oh, I wanted to be different today. I wanted to be thankful, but I just feel like I can't do it. I can't be, I can't be happy. I can't be grateful. I, I can't just let that go, what that guy said to me. I just can't. I can't, like, stare that guy down in traffic who cut me off. You know, I can't not do those things. And you find yourself in that Romans 7 place, right, where the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, that's what I keep on doing. What a wretched man I am. And you just find yourself in this pattern and you just keep doing the same thing over and over, expecting things to change. And you're working the program and you don't know why you keep on failing and slipping, especially in relationships. You love that person, but you keep hurting that person. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You keep on, you, you keep on reacting instead of responding. And you're like, why did I do that again? Or you just show all your emotions on your sleeve. You're trying to keep it in, but you just feel like garbage. And you're trying to put on a good face, but you, can't, you just feel like, I just cannot feel good about what's happening right now. And here's what I think is going on. Is I think you're at about 50.1. <laughs> or maybe 55.8 or 67.3 or 190 <laughs> you got too much stuff in there and you're just not going to be able to fly it's just not going to happen no matter how much you've been working to get yourself in the terminal get yourself up to the counter you've bought the ticket you've made your plans you have your destination but you just got too much baggage it's just too much. And until you get rid of some stuff, you're not going anywhere. You're not going to go anywhere. And so you're going to maybe try at times to give people your baggage. <laughs> try to open your suitcase and give it to other people. You ever done that before? Try to blame other people for your struggles? <laughs> try to manipulate try to make other people your project and therefore you're going to feel better about yourself if they get better and they're not having it they're like man i'm 
I'm right up there too. I'm like 49.8. I'm not taking your stuff because you start to get around healthy people. <laughs> They're not taking it. And so you're at the counter. Some of you are at the counter and you just got too much stuff and you go, this isn't working and you walk back down the terminal and you get in the parking garage and you go home. Because you think something went wrong in the process. You think maybe like you bought the wrong ticket or you went to the wrong terminal, you, you fl you, you're on the wrong airline, but that's not true. What's going on is you just got too much stuff in your suitcase and you're just not willing to offload it. And I really want to just take a look at what that means. What does it mean for you to start really getting rid of some of this baggage that's inside of you? We're going to talk about flying lessons. The first lesson in flying for us the way you get on that aircraft is you just you, you got to pull out some of that baggage okay and so we're going to look at just a few verses real quick and if you have your bibles with you or you can use your phones or like i say you can go on facebook and pretend you're reading the bible whatever you feel like doing you know but i want to take a look at a few things that jesus says and he says this all throughout his teaching and I want you to just take a look at it and, and just say, is this realistic? Is it something that's realistic that Jesus is asking people to do? Is it realistic? And do you think it's this really high moral code that just seems unattainable? Just take a look at some of these scriptures and just tell me what you think, okay? Matthew 5, 39. Jesus says this. Don't resist an evil person. Don't argue with them. Don't push back on them. Don't get angry with them. Don't resist them. In fact, if someone slaps you on the right cheek, you know what? Give them the other one. Is that realistic? We Christian conservatives, we get all fired up about our gun rights. Somebody breaks in my house, I'm going to... Center mass, right? <laughs> you can make sure I got the hollow points. <laughs> right? I'm not saying anything against owning guns, but like our, you know, we, we, we have this idea, like if somebody tries to come at us, nobody's going to disrespect me. Nobody's going to come at me. Nobody's going to hurt me. They're going to find out what's going on with me if they try to come at me. And Jesus goes, no, no. No, somebody physically and by the way if you look at the anatomy of this scripture what Jesus is saying is somebody doesn't just slap you if they backhand you you ever been backhanded before that's insulting somebody backhands you give them the other one too now of course there are some restrictions here today you know physical abuse we don't want to enable behavior that is abusive or problematic but Jesus is trying to tell us something about the Christian ethic. And I wonder what he's trying to say. Think about that. Is this realistic? Let's look at uh, Matthew 5, 44. I tell you, love your enemies. Let's, I mean, just stop there. <laughs> love your enemies. You say, I don't got any enemies. You, you're not really, like, angry at anybody? You don't? Is anybody mistreating you? He said, bless those, pray for those who persecute you. Anybody persecute you before? I'll bless, I'll bless them, all right. <laughs> all right, I'll bless them. Pray for those who persecute you. Has anybody ever persecuted, hurt you? Try to take something from you, try to steal something from you, try to hurt you through your children, try to hurt you through your marriage, try to hurt you at your job. My first thought, I'm going to pray for that person. I'm going to love that. Is that our first thought? That's, these are tough. Are these tough at least? Can we admit this is tough stuff? Yeah. All right, what about this last one? Uh, uh, Luke. Uh, it's actually Luke 6, 28. I think I gave you the wrong verse. Sorry about that. Faith. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Just think about these three scriptures. Is this tough? Anybody think this is just like tough? <laughs> is this hard? <laughs> is this unrealistic? 
It feels a little unrealistic at times. Have you done this? Are you guys doing this right now? I'm not very good at this. So in the book, here's what I say about this, and this is what it has to do with chapter 9 and step 9, okay? This is, I have it up on the screen here. In these verses, God is not just giving us directions on how to please God and treat other people. He's providing us the secret to lasting spiritual liberation. I think too many times we look at these scriptures and we look at this idea of loving our, our enemy and, and, and turning the other cheek is it's just the right thing to do, but come on, that's, what, that's, a, that's a Jesus ethic that just seems way outside of reality. And I sometimes um, go back to, because I'm super old, and I, I watched old TV shows. I mean, remember Michael Landon, right? Remember when he had it? He was a show um, where he was an angel. Yeah. yeah. What was that called? Touched by an angel. Was that the, what it was called? Was that the one with Michael Landon? Huh? Oh, was it Highway to Heaven? And then Touched by an Angel was the Australian lady or something. That was like a spinoff or something. Anyway, I digress. I remember the first show. Way back when, I have to look up what it was called. Yeah, I think it was Highway to Heaven, right? Yeah, Highway to Heaven. It, it first show, one of the first shows, he's this angel who's down on earth and he's trying to do good deeds. He's almost like in purgatory or something. He's, he's down in, in earth because he had made some bad choices somehow and he had to kind of earn his wings back or something. And he's walking around doing good deeds for people like only Michael Landon could, right? And he's walking around helping other people. But he was super, he had like superpowers. He's really strong and all this stuff. And there was this one scene, and I remember being a little kid watching and going, like, that's awesome, is that some guy, he was protecting some woman or something. This guy came in. They were trying to steal her land or something like that. And uh, this, this guy comes in, and, and, and he's, like, attacking this woman, and Michael Landon's defending her, and the guy comes up to him, and he punches him in the face. And Michael Landon looks up at him, and the guy punches him, and he just gives him the other cheek. And then the other guy punches him on the other side of his face, and he looks at him, and he goes... I turned the other cheek. And then he just beat the snot out of the guy. <laughs> I don't think that's what that scripture was saying, right? Uh, so, so, but I mean, for us, I think we, we have limits. There's limits to this, is there not? And then you look at Jesus on the cross. And he's on the cross, and he's looking at the people who put him up there. The very people that had put the nails in his hands and in his feet, same people who had lied so that he would be put up on that cross. He, they lied about him being a blasphemer. They lied about some of the things that he had done. They brought false testimony against him. They spit on him. You ever been spit on? Whew. They ripped his heart out, man. They betrayed him. And he's on the cross and he looks down at him and he says, God, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. Whew. So Jesus didn't just tell us to do this. He did it. And there's some expectation that we do it too. And sometimes we're going like, okay, I'll grit my teeth and do it. But I want you to know that this might be what you're missing in life. This might be what's keeping you from full freedom. This is what's keeping you from flying. This is what's keeping you from being everything that not only God has called you to be, but everything you want in your life as far as that internal joy and freedom and peace is the fact that you can't let go of how you treat and feel about other people. There's some baggage there. Now, here's what I want to do. I want to I give you three ways, three reasons why you want to release this baggage, that you want to get rid of some of this poundage that you're carrying around. Three reasons why you want to follow this scripture and start following the way of Christ to stop fighting and pushing against people and carrying this emotional baggage. Start loving your enemy. Start praying for the people who hurt you instead of constantly pushing against them even in your mind 
that offense that you carry, that bitterness, that resentment. We're going to work on reasons to offload those aren't just because it's the right thing to do, but it's going to help you to fly in your recovery. The first reason is this peace of mind. The first reason you want to offload this stuff is for peace of mind. I want you to think about somebody right now that, that you struggle with a little bit. Um, for me, at times, I can still, in my codependency and in my insecurity, I can still find myself having a conversation with somebody and being so wrecked by it that I'll have that same conversation for the next seven days. Anybody relate to that? I'll find myself arguing with that person or wondering why I said what I said or, or could I have done this differently or boy, I wish I could have said this in that moment or I wish I could go back and, and do it differently. Does that stuff ever occupy your mind? Sometimes I go like, I think about like, how can I manage this relationship in the future? There's somebody who's hurt me and I need to maybe confront them or I need to have a conversation with them and it just occupies my mind for days and I put it off and then I don't say what I really mean. It's just one person, one conversation, one interaction can have me consumed. Not just for hours, but for days. Am I alone? Is that something you relate to? Anybody get that? Can you imagine if that just didn't happen? Can you imagine the peace of mind you would have? Could you imagine what it would be like if somebody said something so nasty and mean to you, offended you, or offended somebody you care about and just attacked you in some way, or, or, or you said something to somebody that's kind of messing with you and they were offended and it just messes with you and messes with you and you're wondering if you kind of just take inventory of everything you say and you're like did they get their feelings hurt or did i did i say something wrong what if you just didn't have that can you imagine what you could manage in your life if you didn't have to manage that as you begin to think about the freedom that that would bring you, the amount of help that would give you to be able to do other things with your life. When you think about these scriptures that Jesus is giving us, it says, love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you. Turn the other cheek. I want you to want, just kind of think, of, like, what if that unlocked my ability to stop managing all these relationships what if your first reaction when you were hurt by somebody was to immediately begin to pray for them what if you did that has that ever crossed your mind is that something that you do on a regular basis as soon as somebody hurts you, as soon as somebody does something stupid, as soon as somebody messes with you, again, somebody offends you, you get in an argument with somebody, as soon as you're, as soon as you're out of that circumstance, you just immediately begin to pray. Or maybe even while you're in it, you begin to pray. What would that do to you? What would that change in your life? Not because it's the right thing to do, which it is, but what if it's because God wants you to have freedom, and in that moment, if you do that, you can fly. <laughs> you can have freedom. One of the reasons I drank is it removed my inhibitions. And I loved the feeling, I don't want to trigger anybody, but I love the feeling of being in social situations and just being like, I don't have to deal with that stuff, that insecurity, that fear. Did anybody use for that reason to just kind of have that, like, I don't have to worry about what other people think of me? What if this drinking, drugs, all those escape mechanisms, I heard this word on Saturday, was a surrogate for the truth that really sets you free? What if it's just this false coping for something that we could have purely and fully? That we could be in social situations and be completely free? 
I just want you to think through what would happen if you felt that way and just consider these three scriptures and like, what if we put these into practice? What if we started offloading some of this stuff and we began to use these tools? The second reason you want to do that is resolution. Now, ch check this out. When you're in that position, when you're struggling with another person in conflict, when you're struggling with somebody else in conflict, you can't get closure. Does anybody ever relate to that where you just can't get closure in a relationship, that it's just a constant thing? It's that insanity, doing the same thing over and over again? Is any of you dealing with that right now? Right now, closure could be yours, not because you figured out to, how to have that relationship with somebody, but you could have closure right now if you gave it to Jesus Christ. You could have closure in that relationship right now, and I think some of our anxiety comes from a lack of closure. When you cannot finish something, it gives you anxiety. When you cannot tie a bow on something, it makes you have anxiety. Heck, if I think I left a burner on at my house and I go to work and I can't get back there. Anybody ever been there before? You do? You just go like, I got to have some closure on this. I'm a guy who can't watch a movie, even if I hate it and not see the end of it. I have to have closure. Anybody know what I'm talking about? My wife can fall asleep in like four minutes. I'm like, crap, I got to watch the end of this stupid movie. Just because I want to know how it ends. I have books, I got to know how it ends. Right? God allows us to have closure when we do the things that he asks us to do through praying for our enemy, for blessing those who persecute us, for turning the other cheek. It provides resolution. I just want to... I just want to challenge you to practice these things and see what happens, all right? And all of these things are possible because of the third thing that it brings us, and that's hope. And the third thing is how all of this stuff is tied together, is that you don't have to be God, because here's what ends up happening. This is the secret, in my opinion. Is that when you pray for other people, you stop trying to control and manage them and you let God have the keys. I think, and I'm getting more and cl more closer to this, the, the more I do therapy, the more I work on my own recovery, the more I see people in recovery, is I would say the root of all dysfunction is that we are trying to control everything. I really think that's everything. I think that's all of it. So when I'm resisting somebody an enemy, a friend, a family member. I'm trying to control them. I think that word resistance could be control. I want to hook them. I want to pull them. I want to push them. I want to make sure they do what I need them to do. And when you begin to pray for somebody, you let them go and you put them in God's hands and you don't have to control them anymore. Wouldn't that be nice? You don't have to control them and you don't have to control the outcome. What do they think of me? I promise you, so much of your mental turmoil is you're wondering, what do people think of me? Anybody relate to that? What will they think of me? What do they think of me? And if they do think of me, then how are they going to act? We're going to have peace of mind. We're going to have closure. We're going to have peace and closure and joy and a fullness of life if we just stop trying to play God. I think the scripture is going to pull it all together for you, all right? The scripture you guys know in Isaiah 40. Let's, let's put that up. Why do you complain, the prophet says, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden? from the Lord here it is my cause is disregarded by my God do you see how a lot of dysfunction comes from us thinking that God can't do it so I'm going to go ahead and manage it myself no. don't you know 
Have you not heard the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? He won't grow tired or weary. In his understanding, no one can fathom. Don't you know that? And don't you know when he says this, back up one slide real quick, no one can fathom his understanding means what? His ways are not my ways. I don't have to get it to give it to him, right? I don't have to have it figured out to give it to him. I don't have to have an answer to why before I can give it to him. I don't have to have him explain himself for him to just take this stuff out of my bag and for me to just have him manage it. We don't have to understand for us to hand him that stuff out of our baggage. He gives strength to the weary and he increases the power of the weak. What do we say in here all the time? God's power is made perfect in what? Uh, when we give up is when he can finally step in. Even youths grow tired and weary. Your youth, it's not going to be enough for you. Young men stumble and fall. I don't care how strong or tough or trained up you are you're all going to be in a position where you're going to be at 50.1 but here we go those who hope in the lord do you guys know this put it on your refrigerator tape it up somewhere those who hope in the lord will renew their strength here it goes they're going to soar on wings like you're going to fly who wants to fly in your relationship with God? Who wants to just be free? How many of you just want to get off of this celestial plane where everybody is trying to manage everything and everybody, and you just, just let go and you can just fly with the Lord? That's what I want, and I've experienced it. It's possible. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk, and they will not be faint. You guys are carrying baggage because you feel like you have to control and manage people. And forgiveness is nothing more than a letting go and letting God. It really is. It's offloading some of this stuff to God and just saying, yes, I want you to take it. I want you to have it. I want you to manage it. It's taking that stuff out of your suitcase and giving it to God. You can have peace if you do that. You can have closure if you do that. You can have freedom if you do that. But what you got to do is you got to do it God's way. But it's not just, this is the part that's so important. It's not just because it's the right thing to do, but it's because it's the key that unlocks that freedom that you guys want. Do you want that? Do you want freedom? Who in your life right now is taking up mental space? Or what's the emotion, insecurity, that you fear of people, fear of man, that you just feel like you just get stuck in that suitcase, you can't pull it out, you just can't get, you just can't get rid of it? Where are you stuck? I wonder if you just stand with me. I'm going to have Jeremy come up. This is just kind of an introduction to what we're going to be talking about on Friday night, kind of in further detail, but if you could stand with me. We call this kind of the economy of Christianity and it's this idea that, it, that the, the kingdom of God is sort of an upside down world I think I've got to fight for things that I have a right to and Jesus says let it go we say man you got to earn my respect you got to earn my love and God Jesus on earth was like I'm going to just unconditionally give you these things you don't deserve it. I'm going to give it to you anyway. That's just kind of, I remember some of the best advice that my, my father-in-law ever gave me. And he said this. He said, never, ever lend money to people. He said, give it or don't. He says, that you can be far more generous. And then when you just give somebody the money, you don't expect it in return. And I think I've been far more generous that way than if I would have just been somebody who bar lends people money all the time. It's a situation if you lend a friend money or somebody money and you're like, hmm, you're always looking at them going, I wonder when they're going to pay me back, you know. 
Even if you forgive it, you're like, well, I forgave that, but boy, shh, kind of a jerk that you didn't give it. But right? You just give it, give it to him. You're free. You're free. You're free if you just give it to him. And the beautiful thing is you're just not letting this stuff go into the universe. You're giving it to God. He says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. That means that he's got it. You just trust him. Those who hope in the Lord, they will rise up on wings of eagles. Just hope in him, trust in him, and just walk in freedom. Wouldn't that be nice? Do you want to let go of some of this stuff? Do you want to just let it go? It just starts with trusting God, praying for those who persecute you, turning the other cheek. It's a supernatural work. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads with me? Father, there's some people who are captive. They're grounded by the stuff in their suitcase that says, I can't let this go. I need some sort of payback. I need some sort of answer. I need this person to apologize. I need to continue to manage this relationship. I can't let this person do that to me or do that to other people. I just can't let that happen. I can't let it happen. But it keeps happening, so you can't stop it anyway. I wonder if you just let go and let God. You just say, God, I'm going to give it to you. I'm just going to let that thing go. And not only that, I'm going to pray for those folks who are persecuting me. I'm not just going to be like, pray, you know, I pray for that stupid jerk. I, I, that we're going to just pray for them in a way that's loving, that we care for them. We're going to try to love them through you. Maybe there's an action in our love. Maybe we've got to tell them that we love them, that we encourage them, that we send them a text and say, I'm here for you. I'm praying for you. I believe in you. I forgive you. If you want to fly, man, if you want to be free, you want to offload this stuff, I wonder if you just say, yeah, that's me today. I've got some baggage, man. I'm holding on to some stuff. I'm, I, I, I get taken captive by people. Conversations I have with people can just wreck me. I get insecure. I get angry. I get frustrated. People just, they can get a hold of me, and I, I don't know why. Can you raise your hand and say you're grounded in relationship? People just get you. They get you. If that's you, you raise your hand. I wonder if you just come forward and spend some time at the altar and say, man, I want freedom from that. I just want freedom from the way that people can just get me. They can take me captive and keep me on the ground. They just, they, they keep me stuck and I don't want to be stuck anymore. I have a fear of people. I have a frustration with people. I get angry at people. There's some people in my life that just, that, man, they just, they can... They can go into my head rent free, and I just want to—I want to let that go today. I just want your help. I want to love people. I want to—I want to pray for people. I want to turn the other cheek. I want it to be easy. I want my burden to be light. I just want to—I want to fly. And the way that I handle relationships just—it's—it's it's keeping me from being free. Just come to this altar and just spend some time saying, "God, pull some of this stuff out, man. I, I, I'm stuck." I give it to you. I want to practice this, this loving my enemies, loving people the way you've called me to do it. Let's just spend some time praying for that in Jesus' name. Would you come to the altar? All my words fall short. I got nothing. How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I often do. Every song I stand, but you never do. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. I know it's not much, I've nothing else fit for a king. 
except for a heart singing Just one move with my arms stretched wide. I will worship you, Lord. So I throw up my hand, praise you again and again. It's all that I have is a together let's do one little flying lesson together okay is there somebody right now that you could say maybe not an enemy but somebody you really have a hard time with is does everybody have one person at least one person that you're just can pop in your head that you struggle with a little bit just three of you is everybody got just some one person that you just like oh yeah a little bit okay I want, let's pray for that person together. Can we do that together? I mean, you all have somebody. I, I'm a pretty loving person. No, I've got somebody too, okay? We'll all do this together, okay? There's somebody you really struggle with. Let's bring them before the Lord and let's pray for them together. And then I want to hear testimony. Maybe you're online watching too. Let's hear testimony of how that relationship has changed or maybe how it's changed you, yeah? Can we pray for that person? Father, we just lift up this person. 
that we're struggling with. We ask that you would bless them. We ask that you would give them success. We ask that you would love them, that they would meet you in a special way this week, God. That, Lord, they would have opportunities that would change their life, Lord God. That you would, Lord, that you would bless them with finances. You would bless them with peace, God. You'd bless everything that they touch. We just pray, Lord, right now that they would experience freedom and joy. And we just want that for them right now. We want them to know the love and the peace and the goodness of God. That's what we're asking for, that you give them yourself and you give them everything, God, that we want for ourselves. We love them as we love ourselves. In this moment, we ask for that earnestly in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Does that feel a little bit better? That kind of feels good. Some of you are like, no. Okay, well, we'll keep praying, okay? Appreciate you guys. Love you. Glad that you're here. Let's go ahead and close with a serenity prayer together. Would you join me? God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference, living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will, so we'd be reasonably happy with this life, and supremely happy with you forever and ever in the next. Amen, amen. Make sure you get to your groups, guys. Ladies, you're back here. Fellas, we're out here to the left, and Mobile One. We'll see you there.